Welcome to the podcast. I'm Tudor Dixon, and I'm so glad you're joining me today. Today, I have a an very fun guest. I met him a few years back at CPAC, and I'm really excited to have him on. David Marcus, he's like, if you follow David on Twitter, you get a really very real person. And that's the thing that I love about him. You probably are noticing that he's also next to me smoking. So you get the full real version. <laughs> of <laughs> David Marcus. And honestly, he is one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter because everything that everything that is real that happens in life, he just shares with you. And I think that's so rare to have somebody who's willing to do that. He's insightful, sometimes sarcastic. He has all of the information on politics. You can read his latest columns on Fox, Daily Mail, Daily Wire. He's also the author of Charade, The COVID Lies That Crushed a Nation. And I am extremely excited to get into all of this. Just before that, I want to really quickly tell you about a new product that I've been using. It's an air purifier, and if all home air purifiers are the, are the same, then I ask you, why did the U.S. Department of Defense select EnviroCleanse to protect and purify the air on board our Navy ships? This is something that I've been using in my house. I got to tell you that when COVID hit and all of a sudden they're saying, you know, you've got to have clean air in the schools, you've got to have clean air in the airplanes. I looked for the option for me that was going to clean air in my house, but I also have a kid that has very severe allergies. So this has been amazing for our house because this has helped her sleep. It's helped her. She has a problem with bloody noses because of allergies, and this is all, everything's getting better. So I just want you to know that EnviroCleanse technology can help keep your family healthy. It's patented earth mineral technology and hospital-grade HEPA filter. EnviroCleanse destroys cold and flu viruses and COVID. So if you're wondering if you can actually get rid of it, you can. And like I said, the allergy inflaming toxins, they're just gone. So make sure you get this. It's on our Navy ships. It's in thousands of classrooms. The EnviroCleanse promise is far fewer, fewer colds, allergies, and better sleep. So you get a free air quality monitor. Test the difference in your own home. Visit ekpure.com. Use the code Dixon for 10% off EnviroCleanse home air purification unit and free air quality monitor plus fast free shipping. That's $150 savings. That's e kpure.com code Dixon, ekpure.com code Dixon. All right, now let's get back to welcoming in David Marcus. David, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. There's so much going on right now. We just were talking about, gosh, you don't even know who you're talking about these days when you say, well, the president, because it could be a former president, it could be the current president. And there is just a massive amount going on. But in the midst of this, something kind of interesting has happened on Fox News where Sean Hannity was talking to Gavin Newsom and he said, would you debate Ron DeSantis? He said yes. Then he got Ron DeSantis on. Ron DeSantis said yes. So now it looks like there's going to be a debate between Ron DeSantis and Gavin Newsom. What's your take on that? I think that this is a wise move uh, for Ron DeSantis, who, who clearly his campaign has been in a lot of trouble uh, since his launch, even before his launch, really. I think the whole soft launch that he did sort of starting in February and well, we haven't announced yet, but I am doing a book tour and I'm in Iowa, New Hampshire all the time. Like nobody bought that. And I think it was a little confusing to voters. Then he did his announcement on Twitter, which I think voters also found a little confusing. This is a way for him to get himself out in front of people in a venue where I think he's really good. Like I think DeSantis is often at his best when he's parrying the left. Uh, so I think this is a wise move for DeSantis. I, I guess it could be viewed as a bit of a Hail Mary. But look, when you're down 30 points, even at halftime, you know, every once in a while you need a Hail Mary, right? That's right. I mean, but we are still pretty far out. I think that's what people are forgetting. Has politics completely taken over our lives that here we are the summer before? And I mean, the summer two summers before, not next summer. We, we're still, this is still the beginning of August. We're looking at a year and three months before we actually have a general election. Are we getting to the point where politics has taken over our lives and we're like, okay, is Ron DeSantis done now a month into his campaign? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think we are. And, and I think part of that has to do with the fact that 
uh, you know, as you mentioned, but with both the current and the former president, there is this nonstop barrage of scandals and indictments. And, you know, I, I said on, on, on Twitter last night, I said, you know, Andy Warhol's famous quote was in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. I think that's now in the future, everyone will be indicted for 15 minutes. Um, you know, th this is just sort of where, where we are. And so, yeah, it keeps politics front and center. I mean, so does like the Bud Light stuff. So does the culture war stuff, you know, yeah. I, I go shopping and I, I'm apparently supposed to like have a checklist of like what company supports what it, it, it gets a little exhausting, but it is where we are. I know. I said something to my daughter the other day about, well, we're not going to buy that right now. And she goes, mom, is this a woke thing? Are you not buying this? Because and I'm like, oh, no. You know, at this point, I don't want them to think I have to double. I have to think twice about everything I do. I mean, I do want them to be thinkers, but I don't want them to be stressed as children. And I think that's where we've gotten a little confused as society. We are putting a lot on kids right now. And we didn't have that stuff on us when we were kids. No, I don't think we did. Although, you know, we might be able to use that to our advantage, Tudor. It's like, you know, if my son wants like some, you know, $300 like piece of equipment or something, I can just say, <laughs> no, sorry, ESG, that this company's complete. Because my 13 year old son is very based, right? So it might even work with them. It'd just be like, they have a very high ESG score. You don't want that. That is hilarious. So you share a lot about your son. I think it's very interesting that you left New York. You're a lifelong New Yorker, but you left New York and you left because you saw a lot of this stuff that you didn't like. But explain to people from your perspective, because I think a lot of people across the country hear about New York, not that not that many people get to experience it, but New York is a culture in and of itself. And I think that lifelong New Yorkers, it's really hard to get lifelong New Yorkers out of New York, but now we've suddenly seen people leaving. And you went to West Virginia, if I'm right. You're right. Um, so that's a big change. A little bit. Um, yeah, no, so <laughs> I was not a lifelong New Yorker. I was I was born and raised in Philly, but I did live the last okay. 20 years in New York. Um, and I love New York. I, I It was the only place I ever wanted to be. Before I was a journalist, I was in theater and I, I spent 15 years doing that there that was just magical. I mean, there's just no other word for it. There, like you say, there, there's, there's experiences that you can have in New York. There's things you can do in New York. That it's just like no place else in the world. And I loved it. But yeah, it's, you know, it wasn't a great situation for my kid right now. And I, I often put it this way. So my son turned 13. And if he was born in 2010, and if you had said to me in 2010, when your kid's 13, um, him and, and three of his buddies are going to take the subway in the afternoon from Brooklyn to Manhattan. They're going to go to the movies. You know, they're going to walk around Central Park. They'll be back around 839 at night. I would have thought, of course. That's mm -hmm. fine. There's no chance I'd let my 13-year-old son do that today. No chance. And so that really was more than anything else what? you know, led to the move was that that and the schools. I mean, I, I swear to God, every day was BLM day or pride day. Or so. I mean, yeah. every day, Tudor, every day. It, it was unbelievable. It was inescapable. So I thought maybe it was like some Hallmark movie story where you chased a woman out to the country, but it was really for your child. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would be the, no, I'm the bad guy in the Hallmark <laughs> Christmas story. I'm the one who like gets left because like I'm too much. <laughs> He's too interested in politics. I just want to sit by the fire and sip cocoa or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you are very interested in politics. So you just started, you just put out a story on Devin Archer. So tell us your thoughts on Devin Archer's testimony and what's going on there. Because I mean, the, the world has got to be looking at this. The rest of the world has got to be looking at this and going, come on, are you guys really, you're really going to ignore this one? I, I mean, look, you know, it, it, it was, it, it was a challenging column to write in part because there's so much evidence that Devin Archer gave that's damning to the Bidens that you really need to just sort of like get on one train to explain to people, here's where the corruption is. And it's right there because Democrats are, this is, this is incredible. Democrats now admit freely that Hunter Biden was selling the illusion of influence over his dad. This isn't in dispute anymore. But but it but his dad didn't do anything. He just talked about the weather. 
Well, okay, right, but 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 we've already moved the goalposts to a place. Right, that no, no, that's what I mean. Now fine. they're like, yes. okay, but right. but it's okay because Joe's fine. Yeah. Now listen, Joe Biden's not some moron who fell off the pineapple truck yesterday. Joe Joe Biden is perfectly aware that if he gets on the phone with executives from Barisma with his son, it says, "Hey, how you guys doing? It's really nice to talk to you guys." He knows it. It's like it's like if you owe a loan shark fifty thousand dollars, and you're sitting with the loan shark, and the loan shark gets a mob enforcer on the phone to say hi to you. You know what "hi" means. I mean, this is right. <laughs> right. You know that this is not like you know the weather's very nice. Thanks for asking. Like that's not what's going on here. And clearly, the people at Burisma, this Ukrainian gas concern. They were under the impression that they had bribed Joe Biden and and they got exactly what they wanted from yeah. Joe Biden. I, it, it, it's it's incredible. Well, but I think you add that you add the phone calls, you add the Devin Archer information up with the video of Joe Biden saying, I said, you got to fire the guy. And you have it all. I mean, it's nice in a nice little package. But why is it so hard to get people to actually look at this and say, this guy shouldn't be president right now. And I, I honestly, I have kind of a different opinion of impeachment here. I believe that this has to come out. It has to be publicly out there and the Republicans should be posting this everywhere, putting ads out, making sure people know the truth about this and let people vote him out of office. I think he should be done. No, I agree. I, 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 I also have some mixed feelings about the potential impeachment of Joe Biden. But I will say, you know, I did yesterday I ran a, a column at Human Events where I, I did call for the expungement of President Trump's first impeachment. Mm. I, I think this is an absolute no brainer. And, I, you know, I've spoken to some people on the Hill uh, who, who, who feel like this makes sense. And can that be done? I mean, yeah. I mean, what does it mean? I don't know. But, I, you know, Congress What does it mean what, to be impeached and then right, stay in it, office anyway? Yes. Right. So, I mean, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if Kevin McCarthy, if, if congressional Republicans, you know, put out a, re a resolution that says we're revoking or expunging or reversing the impeachment. Yes. Impeachment is whatever Congress decides it is. So, of course, it can be done. And, and the reason that it should be done is that there was one fundamental predicate that that entire impeachment was hinged on. And that was that there was no legitimate reason for Joe Biden to ask or pressure Ukrainian President Zelensky to look into Burisma. This could only have been about his own personal political gain. That's not a tenable position anymore. I mean, it's just not. I mean, it, it, this is so shady. It's so clear that Burisma believes it had bribed the sitting president, of, uh, uh, sitting vice president of the United States. Uh, that Donald Trump had every reason to ask Zelensky to do that. Well, and going back to the phone calls, when you talk about, you know, it doesn't matter what Joe Biden says, if, if he took this phone call, the argument is, hey, he was just taking phone a phone call from his son. But I say, OK, that happens to you once as vice president, where you're like, hey, dad, you're on speakerphone with my buddies over here in Ukraine. And then the dad calls you afterward and says, you don't ever put me in that position again. Yeah, if I that's mean, not where you want to be. No, of, 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 <laughs> no, of course. There's no there's no separation of church and state here. Right. So we're now we're expected to believe that Joe Biden had no idea that uh, his son was using these phone calls and business dinners to suggest the illusion of access. Right. We're supposed to believe that Joe Biden had no idea that Hunter was texting Chinese executives saying, I'm sitting here with my dad and you better give me what I want. We're supposed to believe that Joe Biden had no idea that there were a dozen shell companies set up to, to, right. to take in foreign funds from all over the place and distribute them to nine members of his own family. Come on, man, as so, Joe Biden might say. <laughs> so, but how dangerous is this when you look at, okay, so... When this all ha when this impeachment all went down with Donald Trump and we talked about Yankovic or whatever her name was over there and this was all so unfair and how she got pulled back and and there was a, a massive amount of conversation at that time about well to be honest 
the Ukraine is one of the most corrupt countries in, in the world. And we and there is a massive amount of corruption there. So we do have to be aware that this is going on. And and Joe was actually trying to clean that up. You know, of course, the Obama administration was cleaning up corruption and that was going to be good. But knowing this, knowing this now, what we know, knowing the precarious position we are in with China and Taiwan, and knowing that we are taking our reserves and sending them to Ukraine monetarily and now munitions sending over to Ukraine, does this not present a major concern that there is some sort of compromise there that Joe Biden feels like he has to be putting billions into Ukraine right now when really we do have a concern over Taiwan? Listen, it's 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 a perfectly legitimate question. Um, you know, I'm I, I've I'm personally fairly hawkish on the Ukraine situation, just because you know I'm a Gen X kid who you know grew up watching Rocky Four, and I'm not a big fan of Russia. Um, it's <laughs> basically what it kind of like boils down to. But um, no, so so I mean, I, this is the problem, Tudor. Right? Is that like we don't know? Like, like yeah. do, do do I have any way of knowing if if Vladimir Zelensky like has something on Joe Biden and that's why we're sending all these. No, like, like I don't, but I do know that there's an enormous amount of smoke here, that there's a, that there's an, a, you know, there's an enormous problem in, in the influence that his son was peddling in Ukraine. So no, it's, it's a perfectly reasonable question. And obviously one that Joe Biden refuses to answer or even address. So what happens next? Can they say Joe's not going to run? If this gets to the point where it looks too ugly, can they say that? And then based on your experience or your knowledge of the behind the scenes, who do you think they put out there? I think it's tough to do. Look, there's there's one of two ways that this happens. If it, either if if it happens, and I think it's maybe 50 50. My expectation is that Joe Biden's running for president. But if if, if he's not, if there if there if a switcheroo is going to occur, right, happens one of two ways, either with. Joe Biden's approval or without it. With Joe Biden's approval, this looks like a medical scare combined with, you know, I haven't seen my seventh granddaughter ever and I'd like to go spend some time with her. You know, <laughs> something like that. Um, and it's very like, well, this is what I was here to do. I'm the bridge to, to the next generation. If Biden has to get dragged out, um, then that's going to look like the New York Times and the Washington Post turning on him and and other significant leaders within the Democrat Party uh, doing that as well. It, it, it's hard for me to see. I mean, l listen, obviously, Gavin Newsom is sitting here being like, I, I think I beat this guy right now. And he probably does. So I don't know what's keeping Newsom out of the race, and 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 now as you as you you know now Newsom's debating DeSantis. So very weird. It's like on? you've got the two second tier guys who are saying there's a really good chance Donald Trump ha gets has something that takes him out of this race. There's a really good chance that Joe Biden has something that takes him out of this race. So I get Gavin Newsom doing this. I mean, I do think that it puts him in a precarious position because this gives Ron DeSantis a real opportunity to say, look at California. I mean, it's a mess in California, the taxes, the cost of living, the poop on the streets, the migrants coming in. I mean, it's a mess in California. So it gives him that opportunity. But I will say Gavin Newsom is slick. It gives him the opportunity to destroy Ron DeSantis if he wants to. And they are really good with words and how they word things. I mean, he's already said that this guy should be, he's going after DeSantis. He should be in jail for kidnapping. He should be this and that. So does this, is this an opportunity for Gavin Newsom to, if the front runner is out, take out the second guy right away? I mean, look, that, there's a risk. I hadn't actually thought about this in, until you just said it, but you, you, you make a really good point, which is that you know, Gavin Newsom is obviously going to call uh, DeSantis a racist because of the Florida curriculum and a homophobe because of don't say gay, right? Which was a bag of nonsense, right? Th this is what he's going to do. Um, <clears throat> I, I think DeSantis can very effectively parry that. I also think that the Trump campaign is very likely to pile on a little bit, as we saw Byron Donalds do with the curriculum stuff in Florida. You know, Tim Scott might do it. Like, 
DeSantis has to watch out, man. The, the, the knives are out on every side. Like everyone's expecting Chris Christie at this upcoming debate to like go hard after Donald Trump. I'm fully expecting Chris Christie to shoot most of his fire at Ron DeSantis the same mm. way that he destroyed Marco Rubio in New Hampshire in 2016. I mean, he destroyed Marco Rubio. Chris Christie ended Marco Rubio's campaign with that robot Rubio line. That was it. I, I, I watched it happen live. That was it. And it will definitely be interesting. I don't think that Donald Trump goes the, to that debate. Everybody is questioning that. I think that right now the worst thing he can do is go out there and have Brett Baer just go after him on this indictment and this indictment and this indictment and him having to respond. I think that he doesn't go. And I think that is the time when someone arises from that debate as the the clear winner. And I think it could be someone that we are totally uh, not expecting. And I don't actually think Chris Christie is in this race to become that person. I think he is in that race to lift someone and we're not 100% sure who it is. I agree. Now, I, I, I will say yesterday for the first time, I started thinking that there's a chance that Trump might change his mind and do this debate. There was reporting that he was he had dinner, I, I believe, at Bedminster um, with executive, very important executives from Fox News who clearly want him to be there. I, you know, I, I think Trump always wants the stage, right? Like he wants to be in, in the center of the stage. And, and I do think that there is a, I do think there's that fear, right? I, I don't know if this is who you were referring to, but clearly Vivek Ramaswamy is, is, is the person who's got the mojo right now. This notion that he's tied with DeSantis is absurd. It's like, it's, that's, that's just not true. Um, he, there is some good national polling for him. So he's somebody who might be able to have this kind of breakout moment. I think there's probably some thoughts in the back of Trump's mind that are like, I better not let that happen. So mm. I, we'll see. I, I think that it's, if it were up to him alone, I suspect he would do it because I think he can't stand the thought of not being there. He loves uh, this type of, he loves the fight. He loves the showmanship. It's always up to him alone. <laughs> That's a very good point. That's true. I would assume there are some people trying to bar the door, but it, I, I think that's probably happened quite a bit. Yeah. So, I mean, no, nobody tells him what to do. So, and that's part of the charm. I mean, that 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 is that is part of what uh, Americans find so appealing about him. And and I do think it's 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 part of why the the DeSantis campaign has stuttered a little bit. And I think they're they're trying to right the ship, but DeSantis hasn't seemed in charge of it. Like he doesn't. It, you know, it, it feels like this weird team of Twitter I, influencers have been front yes. and center in a way that hasn't been healthy for the campaign. If you're watching the Twitter influencers, man, it is a bloodbath and, and they're doing things that look like they're coming from the campaign or maybe they are coming from the campaign that are hurting him. I think that what you said, like the idea of charm, I mean, Donald Trump charms people. I think that people, especially the consultant world was like, oh, DeSantis is Trump light. He's going to come out and he's going to be able to be the person that can do the things without the nasty comments. But the, the, the problem is that that's the charm is that he can win people over with these off color remarks. And you're like, what, how did he just get away with that? And then he laughs, you know, he thinks it's funny and people think, laugh with him there's that's missing in the DeSantis campaign so they really needed to create a different lane for him they shouldn't have said okay Stan just walk down the same lane as Trump he needed his own lane and that's been a problem but I want you mentioned charm I honestly think that the way you talk on Twitter Twitter is very charming because I think you I wanted to get to this you you are very real you've shared a lot of your personal struggle that's not an easy thing to do on Twitter and you you survive it. I mean, in a really amazingly positive way, what makes it so that you do, why do you do that? Well, that's very kind of you to say. I mean, look, I, I think that the reason that I do it is because first and foremost, I'm, I'm, I was going to say first and foremost, I'm a writer. I mean, first and foremost, I still consider myself an artist. I mean, I, I spent two decades making theater as an actor and as a playwright and as a director and as a producer, you know, just getting people into a room to try to tell them a story. And ultimately I'm a storyteller. Um, it doesn't matter 
who I think would make a good president or a bad president or any of those things. It took me a while as a columnist to learn that because, you know, once you're running at, you know, the Federalist or the New York Times, you say, oh, well, I must be very important and everyone cares what I think. That's not what it is. It's really about getting out into the country, talking to people, hearing what real people think, and then trying to tell those stories. And I don't know. I mean, my stories are are part of that. And my stories involve a lot of struggle. They also involve a lot of, you know, success and and fantastic times in the backyard with my kid and and friends and stuff. And um, I don't know. That's it. I I like telling stories. I think it's unique because you talk about addiction and you talk about struggles with addiction. It's something that we feel like we don't want to talk about. You know, I've had people in my family that struggle with addiction. It's like, okay, we we don't want to we don't want people to know this, but those folks that are struggling, they feel really alone if there's not someone out there saying, "Hey, I I tripped up again. I need help." You've been willing to go out there and say that. That's big to me. I I mean, it's it's you know, it's not none of that's anything that I'm particularly proud of. And, and, you know, I wish that I had a better success story, uh, you know, to share with. I I, I wish that I was a better role model um, in a lot of these ways. I mean, you know, I've been to rehab a couple of times. My life is much better. I'm not completely sober, but I'm not the lunatic that I have been at, at, at certain points. But you know, it, it is hard. Like I, I grew up in an Irish Catholic family when my, you know, I, my uncles would be passed out at two thirty on a Saturday afternoon. And my great grandfather, you know, pop would just be like, ah, oh, well, he's tired from work. You know, it just, you, just didn't, you know, it, you just didn't talk about it. It just wasn't a thing. So um, look, it's a big thing in journalism. It's obviously a big thing in the arts. It's a big, you know, in, in, in the circles that I've run in, this is something that a lot of people deal with. And, yeah, yeah, I just want to be honest about it. I think it, it is amazing to me because I think most people are afraid to come out and say this because, oh, gosh, you know, what if I get fired? What if people are, you know, don't want to spend time around me? And it, I, I honestly, every time I read a post where you share something so personal, it just makes it like I feel like my heart wraps around you in a different way. And I'm like, this is so amazing that this man is willing to do that. So for me, knowing people that have struggled with similar issues, but also just the stresses. I mean, I have a 14 year old daughter and I watch you with your son. And I'm like, he's just very open about what's real. And I think it's a different place because when you come from the political world, everything has to be so careful. And I'm not good at careful. Like I'm my, I'm sure my political team would tell you that. Like, okay, Tudor's just going to be Tudor and say it how it is. But I, I just think that that makes people feel like, okay, you actually get it. You want to be around me. You want to, you want to help me. You want to serve me. Yeah, I mean, look, I think one advantage that I have coming out of having spent so much time in theater is that I never accidentally cross any lines that could get me canceled because I am so absolutely fluent in wokeness or what we used to call political correctness. I mean, I I, I was in so many rehearsal rooms where like I had to choose my words so carefully because I knew that the wrong word would elicit a response that wouldn't help the process, right? That, that wouldn't help make the play better. So, so I had to figure out like, how do I say this? That's not going to turn this rehearsal into a political debate. Uh, you know, and, and, and not every conservative pundit or politician has that. And I think it's very easy to fall into like, just sort of saying the wrong thing. You don't even know it's the wrong thing. Like, how would you, the, the rules change every 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, So that, you know, that's just a, that's a a little thing that I have in my back pocket from the very, very progressive New York theater world. I I like to say the New York theater world makes Hollywood look like like the National Review. It's, it's, you can't even imagine. Well, I would honestly urge everyone to follow you because I think that we can all learn a lot from your openness and your willingness to share. It means a lot to me. I love seeing when you post, you're one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter because I think it is just, it's not ugly. You tell it how it is. You're not fighting people either. I mean, every so often you will shoot back at someone, but I, in such a, I guess it's because you've learned that it, it's in such a, a way that you, it's not like you look at it and you go, gosh, that was a real jerk thing to say. You're like, oh, wow, 
Yeah. Oh, I, do I you ever that. feel, no, I, I feel it sometimes. I think we all do. Everyone who uses social media and you start to feel this like tightening in your chest and it's like, oh, I'm going to tell this person. What, <laughs> and, and, you know, and I learned at a, at a certain point, I was just like, you got to let that go, man. Like that never makes you look good. It, ne- it, it Nothing good comes of it. Just let that go and have some fun. And if somebody insults you, say, well, you know, it's your opinion. I do a little meme from the Big Lebowski or something, you know, try to be fun. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we connected in whatever year it was that we were at CPAC together. Yeah. And I am so thankful to you for coming on today. I really do hope that people read your stuff, follow you. But it, you're just really such an inspiration to me. David Marcus, thank you for being here today. I pre- and if I can just throw the love back a little bit, your run for governor was very, very inspiring to somebody who suffered an awful lot in New York uh, under COVID. I thought what you did was incredibly courageous and I, you know, much respect. Well, thank you. And I think that one of the things that we learned in that is that there are people And this is something that I think that people are looking for in someone that wants to serve them. There are people across the country, and for us, it was across the state, that are all dealing with something, and it's all different. And that's what you have to keep in mind, that when you think that one topic is so hot for you and that you've got to just hit on this, that topic in half the state, they don't care about it at all. But you better learn what they do care about. And that's what I think right now you're able to highlight where you are is that when people are seeing what the country is really hurting and and maybe we're not, people keep saying to me, what are Republicans for right now? Well, I think that's something we need to figure out. What are we for? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Again, David Marcus, check him out. And before I let you all go, I want to first tell you a little bit more about Consumer Tax Advocate. Look, you did the tough thing during COVID. You paid your people and you pulled your business through the pandemic. And now doing the tough thing could actually qualify you for up to $26,000 per employee at covidtaxrelief.org. Government funds are available to reward companies with two or more employees who stayed open during COVID. This is not a loan and you don't have to pay it back, but the program is complicated and no one knows more about it than the CPAs and tax experts at covidtaxrelief.org. You pay nothing up front. They do all the work and they share a percentage of the cash they get you. Businesses of all types, including nonprofits and churches, can qualify, including those who did take the PPP loans. Even if you had your sales increase, you still qualify. You did the tough thing for your employees during COVID. Let covidtaxrelief.org help you get up to $26,000 per employee. Visit covidtaxrelief.org. That's covidtaxrelief.org. Once again, covidtaxrelief.org. And thank you again for joining us on the Tudor Dixon podcast today. For this episode and others, go to tudordixonpodcast.com. You can subscribe right there or head over to the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And join us the next time on the Tudor Dixon podcast. Have a blessed day.